Hey gamers, Chris here. So I recently did a video on concepts and after that I was actually thinking about character concepts and I was scrolling through uh, some fantasy images and I saw this one and I thought, wow, that guy looks really tough to kill. Look at the, all the armor on him. Look at all the armor on the horse. That guy is going to be impossible to kill. And I'm like, I have a character concept. And I thought, a character that's really hard to kill might be an interesting build. And then I was thinking of another concept I was considering recently as well. Uh, the Yuan-T are kind of an interesting race. They're, of course, evil, and they tend to be kind of combined as a society. And they send their purebloods into human societies, often as spies. But Yuan-T are not demons. They don't have to be evil. And I wonder what would happen if you had a Yuan-T who maybe wasn't evil, but they're raised in this evil society, and they're sent out as a spy thinking that they're on the right side, and then maybe once they're there and they start experiencing human culture, experiencing people who are maybe good aligned, then they start to realize that they don't necessarily fit with those Yuan-T so much, and they go native. I thought that was kind of an interesting concept too, so I thought I might combine these two concepts. The Yuan-T who goes native, along with this idea of this thing that just won't die. Now how good can we make a character like that? Pretty good. Uh, this build is going to have an amazing armor class. It is going to end up having amazing saving throws, all of them. Every saving throw. Fantastic. It's going to have a ton, a ton of hit points. And it's going to be able to cast spells, a lot of spells, right up to 8th level slots. Uh, and it's going to do a fair bit of damage in combat. So it's going to cover so many bases. This build really worked out nicely. But the main thing about this build is, it is hard to kill. So I give you the Eternal Cockroach. So welcome to Tree and Monk's Temple. So our goal with this build is pretty simple. We are going to focus primarily on making sure that this character is strong defensively in every single way. Uh, Yuan-T is a great choice right to begin with because the Yuan-T is going to get resistance on saving throws versus magic and they're going to get an immunity to poison. So we're already starting with some strong defensive stuff. But we want to do so much more than that. So as we build this character, this character is really about defense. and not just their own defense, they're actually going to help the defense of the rest of the party as well. This is going to fill that big stupid fighter role or that tank role. They're going to be right up front, taking as many attacks as they can, but they're also going to make their allies about around them better as well. So the race we're going with is the Yuan-T Pureblood. Our Charisma score is going to increase by 2, our Intelligence score is going to increase by 1. So we're not increasing our Constitution, we're not increasing our Dexterity. These are typically what I consider my defensive stats, but we're going to make this character in a way that that's not going to be an issue. With the Yuan-T, we're also going to get Dark Vision 60 feet. We're going to know the Poison Spray Cantrip, Animal Friendship that we can cast just on snakes. That's really circumstantial, but it could come up. And Suggestion, which we're going to get at third level, which is a good spell. These are all going to be based on our Charisma, and our Charisma is going to be our primary stat. So these will all be a nice boon for us. And as I mentioned, you're going to have advantage on saving throws versus magic and immunity to poison and the poison condition. Now this character is going to be multi-classing in a few different directions. But the order in which that is done is important. And the first class you want to take is Paladin. Now Paladin isn't going to be our best choice for us at first level. But starting at 2nd level right through 20th level, we will have an advantage for having taken Paladin first. And that advantage is heavy armor proficiency. Because if you multi-class into Paladin, you don't get it. But if you start with Paladin, you do get it. And this character needs heavy armor. So Paladin has to be our first choice. So we're going to get a couple proficiencies here. And I'm going to take Athletics because I think Athletics is a strong defensive skill. It protects us against things like being grappled. It also allows us to initiate a grapple. I'm also going to take Intimidation just because I think that also can be defensive as well by sometimes allowing you to bypass combats. I'm going to make this character a soldier for the background. I could choose something like Spy as well, uh, but I like the idea that maybe this character has joined a local militia and that's where they've learned their martial capabilities. So we already have athletics and intimidation so we get to choose 
two other skills. We're going to always take perception when we can. And this character will be riding a horse eventually, so animal handling I think is a good choice. Then we get a gaming set. This is a tactical character, so I'm going to take Dragon Chess because he's going to play a tactical game. Now we go into ability scores. This is important. You need to follow this carefully or you're not going to fulfill the multi-class requirements that this character is going to have. So when we choose our ability scores, we're going to be using a point by here. We're going to set our charisma to 14. That's going to give us a 16 base charisma. Charisma is going to be right from second level. Is going to be our primary ability score. Uh, so we want that to be at least a 16. We are going to set our strength to 13. This is important because if you want to multi-class out of Paladin, you need to fulfill the multi-class requirements of Paladin. That includes a strength requirement of 13. So we're going to set that to 13. It's going to allow us to use our chain mail without any difficulties at level 1, and it is going to allow us to multi-class out of Paladin. We are going to set our intelligence to 12. Now, that intelligence of 12 becomes a 13 because of the racial bonus. This also is important for this character because we're going to be taking some wizard at one point. Then we're going to be setting our constitution to 14. This is going to give us a uh, plus 2 to our saves and plus 2 to our hit points every level. So I think 14 is kind of a minimum here. That gives us only 4 points remaining. So I'm going to put 2 in both my wisdom and my dexterity to get them to a 10 so there's no negatives on those. Now we're going to go to our starting equipment. We're going to begin with the martial weapon and the shield. Uh, I'll just take a long sword. At first level, I'm not really going to be using a long sword, but starting at second level, I might be using a long sword. Uh, then I can take five javelins or any simple melee weapon. Again, probably not going to be using them, but I'll grab the five javelins. Then we can take a priest pack or an explorer's pack. I find the explorer's pack tends to have the items that we use in adventuring more often. Then we get chainmail and a holy symbol. We'll say it's an amulet. We can get a dagger, a broken blade, or a piece of banner. I will take a piece of banner just to be interesting. And then we get a set of bone dice or a deck of cards. We're not proficient in either of those things, but let's take the dice. So first level is the worst level for this character. Second level is going to be a huge boost for us. Uh, but this is what it looks like at first level. We do have a good armor class. We do have good hit points. Uh, the issue here is our offense, because the long sword is a plus 3 to hit with a d8 plus 1 damage. That's not good at all. Uh, so what I would actually recommend, just to get through the first level, is that we rely on our poison spray. Because that poison spray is going to do a d12 damage, require a 13 saving throw, so at least it's based on our charisma. Uh, and, I'll, and I would think that you will see more damage on average with that poison spray than you would through using a sword. So we're still going to fill that tank role. We're going to go up front. We've got the good armor class, the good hit points. Uh, but we're just not going to be doing a whole lot of damage at first level. I mean, it's not terrible, terrible damage. Uh, poison Spray does do a D12 damage. And D12, maybe we're not adding anything to that. So 6.5 damage on average. That's below what we would expect most martial characters to be able to achieve at first level. But it's not terrible. Things will get a lot better right at second level here. So we're going to add in now Warlock and we're going to take our Hexblade dip. Now at the beginning of the year, when I was doing Gish guides, one of the guides I mentioned that I never did was I said I was going to take a single level dip in Hexblade and then go with Paladin. So here it is. We've got our single level in Hexblade, we're going to go in Paladin. Now we're not going to go in Paladin all the way with this one, but we're going to do a fair bit of Paladin, so we're kind of fulfilling that right now. So there's three main things we're getting from our Hexblade dip. The first is we're going to get the Hexblade Curse that's going to give us more damage against a single target. Uh, so we get bonuses to damage rolls against a target equal to our proficiency bonus. Uh, we can crit on a 19 or 20, and if it dies, we also heal ourselves. The second thing it's going to give us is Hex Warrior. That's going to give us the ability to use our Charisma modifier on a single one-handed weapon. So now we can use this ability on our longsword to be good with the longsword. And finally, we're going to get some spells. So we're going to get two cantrips and two known spells. We're only going to get one casting, but that casting is for every short rest. So the cantrips I'm going to take are Booming Blade and Green Flame Blade. These are our two melee cantrips. Uh, they're going to give us some damage options in combat. And when we hit level 5, we're not going to have our second attack yet. Uh, most martial characters will be getting their second attack at level 5. We're going to have to wait till level 6. Uh, at that level, those are going to be huge because Booming Blade and Green Flame Blade have both scaled at that point. But even before then, at levels 2, 3, and 4, when we have enemies that are 
bunched together, green flame blade is going to be a good option. If we have an enemy that we just kind of want to lock down, and this is going to be important for us for a long time, using booming blade to help lock down enemies. Because we're going to go into combat, we're going to hit them with a booming blade, and then if they want to leave combat with us, they're going to take that additional damage. We are then going to get two first level spells, and these are basically both a must. We're going to take Armor of Agathis, and we are going to take Shield. Now, I'm not really going to be using Armor of Agathis at this level, but it is a spell that scales exceptionally well. And we are going to have a character here that's going to have very high level spells, but not a lot of spells to fill those slots. Uh, so we're going to be using those slots for things like Armor of Agathis. And Armor of Agathis does two different things. It gives us five temporary hit points, and if a creature hits us with a melee attack while we have these hit points, it takes five cold damage. Now the reason this scales so well is you're getting additional 5 hit points and additional 5 damage for each level of spell. But the thing to remember is, uh, so let's say we cast this with, say, a 7th level slot. So then we're getting 35 extra hit points and we're doing 35 damage. We might often take attacks where we're taking significantly less than 35 hit points. We might be taking 5 hit points at a time. Each time we're hit they're going to take 35 cold damage. So we end up inflicting more damage than we take consistently with this spell. And if we have lots of slots, we can continually reapply it. And this is not requiring a concentration. So we can apply this along with other good spells that do require concentration. Again, not a trick I'm going to be using at this level. I just don't have enough spells yet. Uh, but as we move up in level, having Armor of Agathis on our list is going to be very important to this build. The second one, Shield, is basically a no-brainer. This adds five to our armor class. Now we have a decent armor class already, but adding plus five on it at need is going to be huge. Now we can only do it once, but it's once. And as we go up in levels, we'll be able to do it more and more. So if we go back to our character sheet, what we can do now is we can select our longsword, and we'll just let D&D Beyond know that it is now our hex weapon, and we're going to see a change. So now it has a plus five to hit for D8 plus three damage. That's decent damage and a decent to hit. Uh, this character isn't a striker. Doing damage isn't our primary purpose, but now at least we are in the same league as other characters. And remember, we can use Hexblade Curse to increase that damage to a d8 plus 5. Uh, not bad damage at all. We have 19 hit points, and remember, we do have Lay on Hands. We can heal up to 5 hit points. Uh, usually with Lay on Hands, especially with when it's down at those low levels, I like to use it as a 1 hit point gain for somebody who's maybe making death saves. Uh, it stabilizes them, it gives them consciousness, and then you can do that up to 5 times. So we're going to go back into leveling here, and as we level up, what we're going to do is we're going to take Paladin right to level 8. So the second level of Paladin is going to do a number of things for us. It's going to give us spells, and it's going to give us a fighting style, and it's going to give us smite. The fighting style we will choose is defense. This is going to make our armor class even better. We are going to get four first level spells. Uh, I'm liking Shield of Faith here. It's a concentration spell. Going to increase armor class by another two. So we can get that 18 armor class up to a 19 with our defensive combat style. And then with the Shield of Faith, now it's up to 21. If we cast a shield on top of that, now it's 26. Protection from evil and good is going to give disadvantage to certain creatures like undead and fiends. Uh, when we're in combat with them. Providing disadvantage is better than a plus two armor class. So this, so if we are fighting those kind of creatures, I'd be using that as a defensive spell rather than Shield of Faith. Bless is a good choice for just a buff. It gives bonuses to saving throws for both you and a couple allies, uh, and it's going to help you hit and a couple allies hit. Uh, so just an all-around good buff. Uh, something to do when you, we are not necessarily worrying as much about our own armor class defense, maybe more about our saving throw defense, and we want to do a little bit of a buff to improve our offense. But the most important spell we're going to take is Compel Duel. This is a bonus action cast, so we attempt to compel a creature into a duel. One creature that we can see within range must make a wisdom saving throw. On a failed save, the creature is drawn to you, compelled by your divine demand. And it's important to remember, too, because we have Hexblade, we can now completely focus on Charisma. That is also going to improve the DC for our Paladin spells. For the duration, it has disadvantage on attack rolls against creatures other than you, and must make a Wisdom saving throw each time it attempts to move to a space that is more than 30 feet away from you. So we are getting both locked down, and we're discouraging attacks on other party members. 
when we consider what our role is, that we want the enemies to be attacking us, this is a great way to achieve that. So you're going to go up against that big dangerous bad guy, hit him with a compel duel, and then start hitting him. Uh, then the rest of the party can worry about everybody else while you take on this main thing, and it's basically stuck attacking you. It can attack other creatures with disadvantage. Maybe it has spell casting. It can do that, but it can't move too far away from you, and it, if it does attack anybody else, it has disadvantage. You've done a lot, considering you've only cast a first level spell to achieve lockdown and achieve yourself as the primary target. Now because we have our warlock level as well, we actually have three first level slots now and we get one back with every short rest. So that's not too bad considering we are only a third level character. In combat, green flame blade or booming blade, add on a compel duel if you need to. So we're going to go to level three now. Now here is where we choose our sacred oath and the sacred oath that really speaks to me here is the oath of the ancients. So one thing people tend to know about oath of the ancients is at level seven what you're going to get is an aura of 10 feet around you where any damage you take from spells is halved. So this protects us, it also protects our allies all around us, it doesn't require any spells, it's just up all the time. Fantastic ability. But actually, Oath of the Ancients is going to provide a couple other really great reasons to take it. The first is our Channel Divinity. So our Channel Divinity is available to us once per short rest. And what we get is Nature's Wrath. So this Channel Divinity works really well for our role. So as an action, you can cause Spectral Vines to spring up and reach for a creature within 10 feet of you that you can see. That creature must succeed on a Strength or Dexterity saving throw or be restrained. Well, the well restrained by the vines, the creature repeats its saving throw at the end of each of its turns. On a success, it frees itself and the vines vanish. This isn't the most powerful of the channel divinities. The Oath of the Conquest has a really strong one, uh, but this one is good for our role because, again, we can use it to lock down an enemy. So we've got now multiple ways to lock down an enemy. We can lock them down with a compel duel and we can lock them down with our channel divinity. Furthermore, if we are unable to lock them down. Something like a booming blade can cause them additional damage if they move away from us. The other nice thing about Oath of the Ancients is this spell. It's a first level spell, Ensnaring Strike. It's a bonus action casting. Uh, the next time you hit a creature with a weapon attack before the spell ends, Writhing Mass of Thorny Vines appears at the point of impact, and the target must succeed on a strength saving throw or be restrained by the magical vines until the spell ends. Uh, and the duration is up to a minute. Larger, larger creature has advantage on the saving throw. If the target succeeds on the save, the vines shrivel away. While restrained by the spell, the target takes 1d6 piercing damage at the start of each of her turns. Uh, creature restrained by the vines or one that can touch a creature can use its action to make a strength check. Can just save spell DC. On a success, the target is freed. So the advantage of this over our channel divinity is number one, they're stuck with a strength saving throw. So if they would normally have a good dexterity saving throw, we can bypass that with this. The other thing is they're not getting a saving throw every round. Uh, so it's a little harder for them to get out of it. But we do have to hit the creature with an attack. So there is that added in. So when we go to level four, we're going to get our ability score increase. Now we are using a weapon and we are using a shield. So we kind of need the Warcaster feed here because there's going to be cases where there are spells we want to cast and that's going to be a problem for us because there's going to be a somatic component that we can't complete. So although I want to increase my charisma as soon as possible, I think we'll start with the Warcaster feed. Remember, it is also going to help our concentration saves. Finally, if a creature provokes an attack of opportunity from us, like they're trying to get past us to the rest of the party, we can then cast a spell at them. Uh, and that spell has to be a single action spell. Something like a booming blade even can hit them and then they take additional damage from moving further away from us. So we end up doing a lot more damage than if we just hit them with their sword. The other thing that's happened here is our character is now a fifth level character. So a few things scale. Uh, our proficiency bonus has gone up. That is going to improve our chance to hit with our weapon. It's also going to improve the damage we inflict with the Hexblade Curse. Uh, the other thing that's happened is our Booming Blade and Green Flame Blade have both scaled, but we haven't got our extra attack yet. So this is where those two things are going to help scale us a little bit closer to all the other characters that have gotten an extra attack. Because although we haven't gotten an extra attack, we are inflicting more damage with the attacks we do. Finally, the additional proficiency bonus, of course, means that our save DC has also gone up. So we have lots of effects now that are providing saving throws, 
and now they're a little harder to resist. So going to level 5 in Paladin makes this a 6th level character, and there's a lot of good stuff here. The first thing we're getting is an additional attack. Now we're going to have to choose. Are we going to do a booming blade, or are we going to attack twice? And that will really depend on a couple different things. Number one, do we expect that secondary damage to take effect? If we don't think the secondary damage is going to take effect, or we're not sure the creature is going to move, then a booming blade isn't going to be as good as two attacks. Uh, the other thing is, is if we have a really good weapon, because as a 6 level character, it's very possible we're not using a regular longsword anymore. We may have found something. Uh, if it is a weapon that does significantly more damage, then we are going to want to be attacking with it more often, rather than less often with a cantrip on top. So whether we're going to attack twice or once with a cantrip really kind of depends. So I can't really answer that. Uh, it's going to be, you're going to want to look at what your character has in terms of resources and what's right for that situation. Another big thing happens with Paladins at 5th level because they get their 2nd level spells. As an Oath of the Ancients Paladin, we're going to get Misty Step and Moonbeam. These are both good spells for us. Misty Step, of course, is great for maneuverability, only requires a bonus action. And Moonbeam actually shores up something that we're terrible at because we have no good ranged options. But now with Moonbeam, at least we can use that at range. And Moonbeam actually scales reasonably well too. So we can use higher level slots as we move up in level if we need to be able to attack at range to set up a moonbeam. But we're going to get one more prepared spell and that prepared spell we're going to take is aid. And now the thing about aid is aid increases our maximum hit points not temporary hit points. So we can use aid and armor of agathis together. Furthermore aid affects three creatures so we're not just boosting our own hit points we're also boosting the hit points of two allied party members. And, like Armor of Agathis, aid scales wonderfully. Five extra hit points with each level of casting. So again, we're going to have characters that's going to have lots of high-level spell slots, but not a lot of high-level spells, so we're going to be using aid and Armor of Agathis to really tank up. So here is our character at 6th level. Now I'm assuming we have plate mail at this point. Uh, we may have magical plate. We may have magical shield. So our armor class might be better than a 21. But 21 is actually a pretty good armor class. Remember, we can throw a shield of faith on there, get it to 23 easy enough, and then we can throw a shield on there. So we can get it to 26 if we're not using the shield of faith, or up to 28 if we are using shield of faith. At 6th level, that, those armor classes are incredible. 51 hit points, but it's better than that. We have two second level slots. And what are we going to use those second level slots for? Well, we're going to use them for aid, for armor of Agathis. So armor of Agathis is going to give us an additional 10 temporary hit points. Aid's going to give us an additional hit point total maximum, a five higher. So the aid brings us to 56, and the armor of Agathis brings us to 66. So that's 11 hit points per level. That's fantastic. So we're not going to be hit often. When we are hit, they get punished, and we have a lot of hit points. So the defenses are really building up. The next thing is the saving throws. Paladin level 6, of course, the big thing is we're going to be adding our Charisma bonus to our saving throws. And then because we have Hexblade, we can concentrate on our Charisma. So our Charisma is going to get to 20. When it gets to 20, that's going to be plus 5 on all our saving throws. But not just us. Everyone within 10 feet of us is also going to get those plus 5 on saving throws. And we are going to get another known spell, and at this point we're going to get the Fine Steed spell. So this is the point now where we have the horse. So when we cast Armor of Agathis, our Steed is getting Armor of Agathis 2. When we cast Shield of Faith, our Steed is getting Shield of Faith 2. So, so that Steed is going to be tougher as well. But go ahead by barding for it. Uh, you want to have this Steed be pretty tough as well. Now, the Steed is not going to be as invincible as we are. It can die. But if we put good barding on it and a couple defensive buffs, it's not going to be easily taken down. The Steed is really important for us here, and the reason is is because we're wearing armor that we don't have the strength to qualify for. So what happens when you put on plate armor and you don't have enough strength? Well, what happens is your speed reduces by 10 feet. So currently, we're moving with a 20-foot movement rate. Now we can do things like Misty Step, so we can alleviate that to some degree, but that uses up valuable spell slots. The Fine Steed spell is the solution. So we get on the Steed, now we have great movement. Now when we bring this character to 7th level of Paladin, or 8th level as a total level character, the big thing we get now is our Aura of Warding. So now we are going to be doing a 10 foot radius that not only provides the bonus to saving throws, but 
ourselves and friendly creatures within 10 feet of us have resistance to damage from spells. So not only are we getting advantage on saving throws versus spells through UNT, we're also having the damage from spells. So generally what will happen is you'll get targeted with something like a fireball and then you'll have advantage on the save so you'll make the save which would have the damage and then or of warding is going to half it again. So that fireball damage that would normally be say 24 is going to end up being something like 6. No big deal. Now this is really everything we're going to get from Oath of the Ancients. Uh, so it's almost tempting to multi-class out right at this level. But the thing is, is 8th level gives, gives us that ability score increase, and we really need that ability score increase. Our charisma is still at 16. We want to get it up to 20. So an 8th level in Paladin brings this character to a 9th level character. We now get another ability score improvement, and we can get our charisma up to an 18. And this just makes us better at everything. Uh, our save DC just got better. All our saving throws went up by one. Allies nearby us, all their saving throws just went up by one. We've improved our chance to hit by one. We've improved our damage by one. So Charisma is just helping us everywhere. So now we're going to multi-class. And we're going to take Wizard. And we are going to take Wizard for two levels. The Arcane Tradition we're going to take is War Mage. Now War Magic is going to give us two main things. The first is Tactical Wit. And this one isn't a big deal. We can add our intelligence bonus to our initiative. Our initiative wasn't great to begin with, uh, and our intelligence is a 13, so it's, that's not a big bonus. We're getting a plus one to initiative with this. I'll take a plus one to initiative, that's fine. But that's not why we're doing it. We're doing it for Arcane Deflection. Arcane Deflection comes in at second level, and when we're hit with an attack, or we fail a saving throw, we can use our reaction to get a plus two bonus to AC against that attack, or a plus four bonus to that saving throw. When you use this feature, you can't cast spells other than cantrips until the end of your next turn. So the first thing to note is the big restriction on this, the limitation to cantrip, which is kind of a big deal if you're playing a wizard, is nothing to us. Because we're using cantrips or swords in combat anyway. So very likely, we wouldn't have cast anything but a cantrip anyway. So that's not a problem at all. So what we are getting is we're getting a plus two to armor class when we need it. Now, shield is more effective. Shield is significantly more effective. It adds plus five and it lasts an entire round. And we can't do both. We have to choose one or the other because we only have one reaction. So shield, again, is our better defense. That doesn't mean we're never going to use the plus two bonus because sometimes we don't want to use the first level slot. And that plus two might turn a hit into a miss. So not a bad option to have. But the big thing here is the plus four bonus to saving throws because we can use it on any saving throw. It doesn't have to be in combat. It doesn't matter which save it is. Now remember, we're already adding our charisma bonus to all our saving throws. Now we can add another plus four. So once we have a charisma score of 20, that's plus nine to every saving throw before we even start. So we are going to get some spells here. Remember, these are based on our intelligence, and our intelligence is a 13, so we don't want anything that's going to provide a saving throw or requires it to hit roll. We're going to get three cantrips, so again, we want stuff that's not going to have saving throws or to hit roll, so let's take stuff like Prestidigitation. Minor Illusion is very seldom going to provide a saving throw. It's a good choice here as well. And we'll throw a Mage Hand on here as well. So three solid cantrips. And none of them are going to create a problem for us using intelligence as our casting stat. The first thing we're going to take is absorb elements. The spell captures some of the incoming energy, lessening its effect on you and storing it for your next melee attack. You have resistance to the triggering damage type until the start of your next turn. The first time you hit with a melee attack on your next turn, the target takes an additional 1d6 damage of the triggering type and the spell ends. Uh, and so basically we use a reaction and then when we take acid, cold, fire, lightning or thunder damage, we can half it. Now you might think, well, we can already half it with Aura of Warding. Well, we can half it from Aura of Warding if it's by a spell. But what if it's a dragon breathing fire on us? Do we want to have any defenses that we haven't entirely covered? No. This character is the eternal cockroach. In comes the dragon. Now we're going to use Absorb Elements. Half the damage from that. The next spell we're going to take is Find Familiar. You all know why you're taking Find. You all know why we're taking Find Familiar here. I'm not going to explain it again. And the last spell we'll take is Featherfall. Shore up yet another kind of damage we might take. So now we really just can alleviate damage from everything. Uh, regular attacks, amazing armor class, good hit points. Anything that provides saving throws, we're going to add our Charisma bonus. Also, we can use our Arcane Deflection so we can get a plus 8 right now. We'll eventually be able to get a plus 9 on any saving throw. If we're going to fall, we can use Featherfall. 
If we're going to take damage from a non-spell that does energy damage, then we can use our absorb element. So we've just we're covering every basis. Now we can add one more spell to our spell book here. Uh, I'm thinking Expeditious Retreat is a good choice. If our steed dies, then we can use Expeditious Retreat to increase our own movement, which is going to be kind of gimped by us wearing armor that's too heavy for our strength. Or we can cast it on ourselves while we're on our steed, share the speed with the steed, so now the steed moves super fast. So we can cover amazing distances now. So yeah, this is two levels of our character that's kind of in a class that doesn't seem to fit, but we're getting so much out of it. So here's our character at 11th level. At this level, I'm assuming we have maybe plate plus one, a shield plus one, maybe a ring of protection. So that's going to give us a base armor class of 24. If we use shield of faith, then we can make that a 26. If we use a shield spell, we can now bring that to a 31. So we're now getting to the point where we can get into the 30s for armor class. We're going to get higher. 87 is our current hit points, which is okay, but we're going to be much higher than that. Remember that those wizard levels increased our spell slots along with our paladin levels. So now we can cast up to third level spell slots, but we have no third level spells. So what are we going to do? We're going to cast Aid and Armor of Agathis. Between the two of them, that's another 25 hit points. That brings this character to 112 hit points. At 11th level, that is very strong. Now our final third level slot we can either use to recharge Armor of Agathis or we might use it as a long range moonbeam if we need a long range spell. Though generally because of our fine steed, because we can do things like expeditious retreat, we can cover large distances in a single round. Uh, but sometimes there's reasons why we can't get to somebody. Maybe they are up on a wall or something like that. Moonbeam gives us that range damage attack. Uh, 3d10 damage per round in an area of effect. Not great damage, but at least we can contribute in that way. A lot more than if we had, say, taken something like an Eldritch Blast. And people are going to ask me, why didn't you take Eldritch Blast with our Warlock level? Well, because we're not going to get Agonizing Blast, because we're not taking a second level of Warlock. If we were taking a second level of Warlock and taking Agonizing Blast, then it becomes an okay ranged attack. But for us, it's just not worth it. In combat, D8 plus 4 damage. Uh, and again, we've probably got a magical weapon at this point. There's so many options for magical weapons, I wouldn't even know which one to put on this character. Uh, so we're going to be doing more than that in damage. Plus 8 to hit, nothing wrong with that. Again, probably got a magical bonus on there as well. Uh, but remember, we can increase this damage a lot. These saving throws are lovely now. So we've got our lowest saving throw is Dexterity at plus 5, but it's actually going to be plus 9 because we can use our Arcane Deflection if we ever fail a saving throw. Uh, so we can't get less than a 10. Now with Constitution, we can't get less than 12. And remember, if we're making Concentration save from damage, we're doing that with advantage. So imagine plus 11 with advantage we're almost never going to lose concentration. So to some extent, this is kind of an apex of this build. All the basics have all kind of come together here. We have good armor class, good hit points, good saving throws. We can resist all kinds of different damage. And we have a fair number of spell slots. So a lot of things have worked in our favor here. Uh, and I thought a lot about where I would go from with this character from here. Uh, because Fighter is an interesting selection, especially something like a Battle Master or an Eldritch Knight just to increase those spell slots because things like Action Surge of course can be very useful here as well. And we could potentially get into ninth level which would get us Indominable which would allow us to repeat a saving throw that was failed. So there's some advantages there but the one I decided was really the best in this situation was Bard. So Bard is going to give us an additional proficiency. Uh, we're going to take a musical instrument. I like a flute because I'm a U on T and then I'm kind of a reverse snake charmer. And we get one more skill and I'm going to take persuasion because I am a charisma based character. We get yet another bonus action. Uh, we can use bardic inspiration now to buff our allies giving them a bonus d6. We're going to be using our bardic inspiration differently as we level up. At, at level one that's what's going to happen. Two more cantrips. Man we get a lot of cantrips. I like friends in this situation. I think it's a good choice. And I'm thinking I like light in this situation. So we get four first level spells. I'm going to prepare Long Strider. This is a way to improve movement without using concentration. Again, if I am ever off my mount, that gives me the ability to move at my normal 30 feet. Uh, I have lots of first level slots, so that's not an issue. 
Healing Word is a useful spell. Gives us yet another bonus action thing. We have so many bonus action things now. Uh, things like Ensnaring Strike. We have our Hexblade Curse. We have our Bardic Inspiration. Healing Word. On and on. We will be using bonus actions every round. No problem. I'm liking Fairy Fire here. Fairy Fire is a good way to deal with creatures that can turn invisible or hide on you. It's also a good way to provide a basic buff by providing advantage on attacks against a set of creatures. And we already have a number of spells and abilities that can control where things can move, so I'm going to also put in Dissonant Whispers. I think it's a good addition to that mechanic for us. And I'm just going to jump the Bard up to level 3 here. Uh, things start to happen at this point. The Bard College we're going to take is College of Swords. This gives us a fighting style, and the fighting style we'll select is dueling. This is going to increase our damage with our longsword by two. We're also going to get an expertise on two skills. I always like to have perception as expertise if possible, and let's take persuasion as well. So we're going to get a couple second level spells. The first one I'm going to take is Sea Invisibility, uh, just to take care of situations where maybe I don't know where to throw that fairy fire. The second one I'll take is Lesser Restoration. Just a useful spell to have in your pocket when you need it. But going back to our class features here, so in addition to spells, we're getting all kinds of fantastic stuff here. This one's minor, Song of Rest. When you take a short rest, you can basically have the party add a die to their short rest healing, which is okay, uh, but, it's not, but it's not super powerful. Jack of all trades is very nice. Starting at second level, we add half our proficiency bonus, round it down to any ability check we make that doesn't already include our proficiency bonus. This, of course, improves our initiative, which is lovely. Uh, and it, of course, improves every single skill that we're not proficient in. Uh, and we are getting up to a higher level. So our proficiency bonus is also increasing as well. So Jack of all trades becomes more and more valuable. But the big one here is Blade Flourish. So when we make an attack, we can use one of our Bardic Inspirations, and we have four of them a day to do a Defensive Flourish. There's actually three kinds of Flourishes, uh, and you can choose any of them. But the Defensive Flourish is the one I'm going to kind of concentrate on here. So we expand one use of Bardic Inspiration to cause the weapon to deal extra damage to the target we hit equal to our Bardic Inspiration die, which at this point is a d6. It's going to become a d8. The damage equals the number you roll on the Bardic Inspiration die. You also add the number rolled to your armor class until the start of your next turn. So like shield, this is one of those armor class boosts that last the entire round. So uh, so many armor class boosts affect one attack, but we can be attacked many times, especially with this character that is specifically trying to be the target of enemy attacks. We might be attacked many, many times. Uh, so this is going to add armor class to all those attacks. Uh, at this point, we would expect it to be between 3 and 4, uh, for a full round, up to 4 times a day. Now, remember, once we get 5th level in Bard, then we're going to get these back on a short rest. And once we get our 20 in Charisma, we are then going to be able to do this 5 times per short rest. So that's quite a bit. So here's our character at 14th level. We now have 108 hit points, but now look at our spells. Because we are adding our progression from Paladin, from Wizard, and from Bard together. So the highest level spell we have is a second level spell, but we can cast up to 5th level spell slots now. So an aid cast with a 5th level slot, which is what I would do with this, is going to give 8 hours of 20 extra hit points to 3 party members, including myself. And then I have 3 4th level slots. One of those 4th level slots I will certainly be using for Armor Bagathis. That's going to give me an additional 20 hit points. So that's 40 additional hit points. Takes this 108 hit points to 148. Again, we're holding this pattern of having more than 10 hit points per level. That's really quite good. Now at this point, I'm assuming we probably have a Cloak of Protection. Uh, maybe plate plus two, maybe a shield plus two. Based on that, our base armor class is 27, which is a strong armor class. Uh, but again, we can increase this in so many ways. First off, if we put a shield of faith on, then it's going to become a 29. If we throw a shield spell on top of that, it will become a 34. If we have a defensive flourish, that'll probably add another three or four. We're now into the high 30s in armor class. Now this is limited use. We don't have shield every round. We don't have blade flourish every round. Uh, but we can do them a reasonable amount of the time. I mean, our character has five first level slots and it gets one of them back with every short rest. So that's a fair number of first level spells that we can use on things like shield. 
and again, we're not even adding shield until we've already been hit. And most of the time, we're going to be missed. It's going to be pretty rare. Uh, we're almost getting to the point now where the only thing that'll ever hit us is a critical hit. Uh, and that's where we'll be glad that we have that armor of Agathis up and we have those extra hit points through aid. And remember, we can recast our armor of Agathis, get those hit points back. Once we get through that armor of Agathis and get into our actual hit points, we also remember have Lay of Hands as an 8th level Paladin now, so we can heal 40 hit points in one action if we want. Because of Jack of All Trades, our initiative now is at plus 3. That's not bad at all. So basically we have a dex of 10 because plus 1 from Tactical Wit and plus 2 from Jack of All Trades. So we're going to jump up the Bard to level 5. That makes this a 16th level character. Now one thing I do like about this build is Right from level 2, it seems like every couple levels we're getting so much, because this one kind of hit, say, a peak at level 12 where everything seemed to come together, and often when you add more onto it, you don't feel like you're getting as much. But with Bard here, I really do. I think that this character is advancing very nicely. Number 1, ability score improvement. We're going to get our charisma up to 20 at last. Of course, you know we have all kinds of benefits from that. But big things here is our inspiration just got better. We not only have Fund of Inspiration, which is going to allow us to get all of our uses back on a short rest, but we've increased our ability score, which gives us another use of Bardic Inspiration uh, per short rest. And finally, our die type has changed from a D6 to a D8. So it's improved in three different ways. We're picking up another cantrip. I'm not even sure what to take here. I'll go ahead and take Mending. So many cantrips with this character. And I get two third level spells. I'm going to take Dispel Magic, and I am going to take uh, Lehman's Tiny Hut. So Lehman's Tiny Hut is a ritual spell, so it's not going to use any spell slots. Uh, and then it, of course, helps us enable a long rest. Uh, somebody else might already have Lehman's Tiny Hut in the party. Then you might want to take something else. But if nobody else has it in the party, now we do, and it is a very useful spell to have. Uh, Dispel Magic, one of the nice things about it is that if we want to dispel higher level spells, we can use a higher level slot. We have all these extra higher level slots available, uh, so something like Dispel Magic works very nicely. So this is now a 16th level character. Uh, I haven't changed the armor class at all, so 27, Shield of Faith, 29, Shield makes it 34, uh, and then if we did a defensive flourish on that, we're now using a D8, so we might expect 4 or 5. So we're looking at 38 or 39 armor class that we can get together. Now, there's no creatures in the game that can hit that on less than a 20. We now have... 3rd level spells, 6th level spell slots. So aid is now going to give 25 hit points to 3 party members, including us. That brings us to 147 for hit points. Then we can use a 5th level slot for an armor of Agathis for another 25. That's going to bring us to 172 hit points. 16th level character, we're still averaging over 10 hit points per, per level. And look at these saves. The worst save there is dexterity at plus 7. And that's plus 7 without Arcane Deflection, so it's actually plus 11. Plus, most of our saves are going to be made with advantage, uh, so we're really just not going to fail saving throws. And I don't care what save they target. And we're immune to disease, we're immune to poison and the poison condition. We can give ourselves resistance to all kinds of damage. Uh, so this character, the Eternal Cockroach, man, hard to kill. And we haven't totally given up offense either. Remember, this is a smiting character, so we can add smites to our attacks. We have multiple attacks per round. We have other things that add to damage as well, like things like an ensnaring strike, for example. Or maybe we're doing a booming blade or a green flame blade. Maybe never mind the fact that we can do spells when we do attacks of opportunity. So there's so many different ways now that this character really comes together to be just super, super tough and still delivers a decent amount of damage. This is not sword and kind of damage. Uh, if you want a single target striker, this isn't that character. This character is about the defense. But we're not bad offensively. We still hit pretty hard. Now there are less features to talk about in these last four levels. So I'm going to go ahead and take Bard right up to level 9. We'll look at the 20th level character and see how it all comes together. So we're going to get an additional ability score improvement and we're going to take a feat. So we're going to take the Sentinel feat. Sentinel feat is a good feat for somebody who is a lockdown character. Now we have lots of ways we can lock things down. We can use our channel divinity. We can use ensnaring strikes. We can punish them with booming blades. But 
Sentinel gives us yet another way to lock things down. When we hit a creature with an opportunity attack, its speed becomes zero for the rest of the turn. Creatures pro provoke it to opportunity attacks, even if they take the disengage action. So once we enter melee with something, it just cannot get past us anymore. And we can now use our reaction to attack creatures to punish them if they attack anyone else but us. Works nicely with Warcaster, and I think it's a good selection for this character. Now, if you wanted to be ridiculous, you could take Toughness here, because the Tough Feet, of course, would give you an additional 40 hit points, uh, but we have lots of hit points, so I just kind of figure we're, we're stacking on things that are already where they need to be. Uh, I don't see a lot of value in adding even more hit points to this character. I see more value in adding abilities to this character. That's why Sentinel, I think, is better than Tough. Polar Master would be another option. We could use a Staff with our one hand, uh, and that's and Polar Master would allow us to get an opportunity attack against something that comes into melee with us, though we are generally going to be entering melee with enemies. I do think Sentinel works a little bit better for us. We're going to be choosing four more spells, and we can choose up to fifth level spells. Uh, so we're going to look at our fourth and fifth level selections, probably take two of each. The two fourth level spells that just jump out at me. Freedom of movement takes care of us when we are fighting creatures that impede our movement. Casting it on themselves is probably a good buff to do. Doesn't use our concentration last an hour. Uh, I think that's worth a fourth level slot. Uh, the other one, Greater Invisibility, I think is really good because we can shore up our defense even more. Now creatures have disadvantage to attack us. Disadvantage to attack us and they need a 20, good luck. But we also are improving our offense and fairly significantly. Remember, we could combine this with something like a Hexblade Curse. So now we're getting advantage on multiple attacks per round with a crit range of 19 or 20. That means fairly often we're going to get crits. And when we get crits, we can smite to double the damage of the smite. And we can do up to 5th level smite. So that's additional 68 damage becomes 12 the 8 additional damage on one attack. Uh, additional damage. So that's pretty good damage. Again, we're not quite in that single target striker, but a tank character should still be decent offensively. This character is. For our 5th level slots, we're going to go a little more into the healing role. We'll take Greater Restoration, we'll take Raise Dead. Uh, so this just kind of covers up all the healing stuff. Uh, we, of course, can heal 40 hit points with our Lay on Hands. We can also help with things like disease or the poison condition with our Lay on Hands as well. We have our Lesser Restoration for a number of conditions. Greater Restoration takes care of other conditions, some that there's no other way to take care of, like a permanent stun or a petrification. Uh, and then if characters actually die, then we have the raised dead as well. So we've got all our bases covered there, except for healing just massive quantities of damage. That's going to have to go for somebody else. So let's see how this all came together at 20th level. This is a great 20th level character. Uh, when we're talking about this style of character, the big stupid fighter, uh, the tank, the eternal cockroach is going to excel in that role from levels 2 through level 20. The Eternal Cockroach is a good choice for that role. Things really come together around level 11, and then it just keeps rolling on. Bard just delivers and delivers for this character. Uh, so I'm assuming now we probably have Plate plus 3, Shield plus 3. So that's giving us a base 29 of armor class. If we're adding a defensive flourish, then we're probably looking more like a 33. If we save through a Shield of Faith, we could get 35, then we should throw a Shield spell on. We could get a 40 armor class with this character. That's really very good, and we can do it multiple times. This isn't just once, and it lasts the entire round. Now we have 150 hit points for this character. That's not bad for a 20th level character, but that's not what we're going to have, because we now have 8th level spell slots with this character. Yeah, this guy, this tank, has up to 8th level spell slots at 20th level, uh, so we're going to be casting an 8th spell with our 8th level slot. That's going to give us additional 35 hit points and two allies an additional 35 hit points. That brings us to 185. Then we can use a 7th level slot for an Armor of Agathis. Now we have 220 hit points. And remember, Armor of Agathis can be cast over and over again. Uh, we're not going to be using a 7th level slot with it every time. We might use 6th, 5th, even 4th level slots. Uh, but remember, we're also doing damage to our enemies with this spell. Not that often, because we're almost never getting hit, of course. Our best defense and offense uh, boost is with a greater invisibility, added on with a Hexblade Curse. So we do a greater invisibility, Hexblade Curse, go in there, start smashing stuff. We're going to be critical hitting all the time, throwing on smites. We have so many slots, so, so many slots. And we can 
easily throw fourth and fifth level slots out uh, for smites without a big problem. Uh, and when we're doing that on a critical, it's going to be adding a lot of damage. So we're in, going to end up doing a reasonable amount of damage with this character. We already went over the saving throws. They're all fantastic uh, because remember you're adding plus four to all the numbers you see here. Uh, and skills, of course, we have jack of all trades, so we're decent at any skill we try. And our persuasion plus 17, our perception plus 12, 22 passive perception. We can get resistances on everything. Plus we have a number of immunities. Uh, this character, like I said, I think this is about as hard as you can make a character to kill. And it surprised me when I made this character that it still kept up the offense reasonably well, still has a lot of spells uh, and a lot of spell slots. Uh, so I like the way this character comes together. Super strong on defense, but doesn't give up on the other stuff. So that's the Eternal Cockroach, one tough son of a bitch. So I'm going to sit back. I'm going to relax. I'm going to have some fun. D&D is for everyone, and I'll see you guys next time.